Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we have got episode number 53 for you all. And the time has come. We've been talking about it for months now. The playoffs are around the corner. They're around the corner. Well, now they're here. No more waiting. The best time of the NBA season is here. We actually were just talking about it right before we hit record. This is basically the exact same time last year that we started the Off the Glass podcast. So if you've been here for a full 365, actually 366 is a leap year. Shout out Tyrese Halliburton. Um, If you've been here for a full year, we appreciate you. Make sure that you like, comment, subscribe to the video because this is going to be a jam-packed episode because like I promised in the last one, we are going to be giving you our picks for every single NBA award. We're going to be giving you the defensive teams, the all-NBA teams, the all-rookie teams. We are going to be giving our ballots as though we really had one, like we are members of the whatever, 100 or 110, however media members get votes. We took it probably more seriously than some other people because yeah. – some of y'all be having some questionable decisions. Um, so not going to spend crazy amount of time on the intro. You know the housekeeping. Like I said, like, comment, subscribe, follow us on the socials, at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram, at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. How we doing today, Dame? How we feeling now that we are here? End of the regular season is officially behind us, and we are looking forward to the playing tournament, and more importantly, the NBA playoffs. I am feeling great. I cannot wait for the playoffs to start. Um, the playing games, we're going to have some pretty good playing games, so I'm excited for that as well. But honestly, I just feel like uh, we got some good matchups for the playoffs. You know, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be, especially in the West, it's going to be no easy no easy series. So it's, it's going to be exciting, bro. I can't wait. I cannot wait for it all to start and see how everything, you know, kind of unfolds a little bit. West is looking like an absolute dog fight. Bloodbath, wow, wow, whatever you want to call it. It's crazy and to think next year you want to get the Grizzlies back healthy. Wemby's, if they construct even a semi marginally better roster around him, mm-hmm. they could take the leap to try to push for a plan C. That, and you already had the Rockets who were all the way to the last couple games of the season competing for that 10 spot. That mm-hmm. puts you at 13 legitimate play in at least contention teams out west bro yeah it could get scarier than this which is wild to think about that's that's that's, yeah (laughs) that's pretty scary you put it that way um but like i said we're not going to cut around and and do a huge intro because we got a lot to get through because on the back half we are going to be talking through the preview of the playing tournament since that is tipping off wednesday i think um, I believe so. Are the, the first games. Um, that's going to run all the way through to the weekend, and then we're officially going to be in the playoffs. I think the first series tip, I want to say on Saturday um, or Sunday. So, going to get you right and ready for all things playing related coming. Actually, they start tomorrow. I didn't even peep that. Um, oh, so, wow. even okay. earlier than that. Yeah. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to go right into our NBA awards. And in the spirit of not dragging stuff out, I say we should start with the biggest, most debated, at this point, most toxic award <laughs> debate, which is the 2023-2024 NBA Most Valuable Player MVP Award. For From the media's perspective, Coming down the last month or so of the season, it turned into a two-man race. I'm going to do a mini rant right quick just to make sure that I say this on the front end. Legitimately, and I have it here written down in my, my list, there are six guys who have not, – not saying that every case is the same, obviously, but six mm-hmm. guys – who I think legitimately have an MVP type case this season. Six. I think realistically, when it came down to it, they pigeonholed it to a two-man race. I think that ultimately did a disservice to Shea Gilgis Alexander, who got left out of the Luka Doncic, Nikola Jokic conversations. I want to make sure on the front end I give Shea his flowers because 
I don't know how the official votes are going to shake out, but the fact that he, as the lone all-star on that roster, led the Thunder to the one seed in a conference that we just are talking about is unbelievably loaded with talent and depth has them sitting at the best record in that conference and has them at home court advantage all the way through the conference finals if they can get there in the West. So want to make sure that he gets his flowers, putting up ridiculous numbers for that team. And of all the, the guys in this conversation, you can have an argument. He might be the best defender on this list too as well. So That's true. Make sure he gets his flowers up front before we get into any, any more conversation. But – with that, do you want to go first or do you want, want me to go first? So the, my question is, are we going to say who we have first and then, like, see if it's different and explain it? Or are we saying who it is and explaining why? How deep did you go? Did you just pick or did you, like, put third place, fourth mm-hmm. place, stuff like that? I can easily just come up with it right now. I I know okay. who my first, second, third. Yeah, I know my top five is. Okay. I have, I, I guess I have a top five, but I, I know who the six is too. So we can work quickly bottom to top and get there. Okay. So who would you have? I, I was going to say off the rip, six first, six place for me ended up being Jason Tatum. Okay. He's my fifth place. I'm curious my to see fifth. who your fifth place is. And then I don't have a six. My, I just have five. Yeah. My fifth place. If I had legitimate vote, I think the voting goes all, we have to pick five um, mm-hmm. on an official ballot. If I'd have had that, that fifth slot, it was going to Jalen Brunson. I'm not mad at it at all. I wasn't even thinking about Jalen Brunson, but I'm not mad at it at all. I hear the you. The way okay. that he finished this season locks up the two seed in the East. No Julius Randle for basically the since like January. Mm-hmm. OG is in and out with the elbow injury. Mitchell Robinson was out most of the season. So much could have happened for the next season to fall apart mm-hmm. and for them to slide down the standings. And they went in the opposite direction and catapulted them into a, an albeit right, an Eastern conference that is not nearly as deep or as talented as a Western conference. But for him to be playing the way that he is, for, for him to go into every game, for the opposing team to know how much has to come from Brunson on a nightly basis to create offensively for this team and he does it night in night out delivers in big moments he's able to facilitate obviously the shot creation is out of this world on all three levels um he genuinely i don't know where this next team would be in the spirit of being the most valuable player award where would this next team be without jalen brunson no you're they would not even remotely <laughs> close to this conversation so I, <laughs> he ended up being in my five slot I'm, you have I'm, a four? I'm, I'm not mad at that. I like, yeah. Like I said, I wasn't even really considering Jalen Brunson. But when you think of like the season that he's had and the context behind it, he definitely has a, a definitely a case to say he had an MVP level season. Yeah. Um, my five, who I said was Tatum. My four mm-hmm. is Giannis. My Giannis is my, Giannis. my fourth as well. He he was higher up in. If we had these conversations a couple months ago, <laughs> he would have been a little bit higher. Absolutely. We'll, we'll get to it, I'm sure, probably in, in episodes coming up here throughout the playoffs, but I'm very afraid for the Bucs, man. Very that, afraid for the Bucs. We talked about it after thing. Adrian Griffin got fired, that they were running into this tough spot, toughest part of their schedule with Doc, and it has not looked good <clears> from <throat> all accounts. Like, And the most important one being the record, they lost significantly more games under Doc than they did with Adrian Griffin. Again, mm-hmm. granted, this the strength of schedule is much harder, but it it does not feel like this is a team that is steamrolling into the playoffs, ready to make that that push to be on a collision course with the Celtics. It feels like a team that looks very beatable to lose before they can even get there. Yeah, unfortunately, and that's the reason why he's a little bit lower on the MVP list. Because granted, on, even though he's had a great season, it's just I don't like the way the Bucks have been playing, especially under Doc Rivers, like you mentioned. So. Yeah, he just kind of fell a little bit for me. Um, mm-hmm. but so he's at he's at both of our four. Uh, my three is Shea Gilders Alexander, and it's like you said, it's tough because I mean, I guess with him and Brunson, it, like, bro, in a normal year, even if this was like years ago, it's like that's an easy MVP season. You're the one seed. Right. You average thirty a game. 
you you're a great defender. You I believe you led the league in steals. Like you can have a case to be an all defensive team. You know what I mean? But like hundred <laughs> percent. This ain't no listen. The NBA is not normal anymore, bro. No. Like it's, it's not like these type of seasons. It, to say it's not MV like it's not good enough to win MVP is ridiculous. Considering like back in like you know when we were growing up like 2010 something around there. Like this is a run. Shay put this season back then. Well, with all the context, this is easy. He's running away. Easy. MVP. Like, it's Run even, away. It's not even close. Could have been, could have been unanimous type. Seriously, but it, but you know, what I mean, the NBA has changed. So for me, he's yeah. uh he's my third. Shea falls for three as well. But again, I want to make it really clear. Like, if you ask, I had six guys. You had those six, five, four. Then there's a gap, and Shea fits right into that combo with Luca and Jokic to me. And I like I want to make sure y'all hear me here because I've seen, <laughs> like I said, the discourse around this award has gotten so toxic in the last couple of years. People's tied up with fandoms, tied up with going against narratives, pushing narratives. Like, just understand it's not easy to like. If there was a way that you we could give out multiple MVPs of any year, this feels like the year, bro. Because there's so many people who are deserving. But like you said, thirty points. Six assists, five and a half rebounds, and led the league um, in steals. Um, one of the best defensive guards at just being a disruptor. Um, phenomenal season for Shea. 100%. So <laughs> we are here at the final two. And I'll be honest, I debated all the way up until maybe 45 to 30 minutes ago. Very, very difficult for me to take. <laughs> and there's so many ways you can take it. There's so many ways, avenues. L literally nothing I can say about either one of them. Like, you can't take anything away from the other. Like, they both have such good cases to stand alone. There's nothing that you need to say to be like, oh, well, Yoke is this or Donchus is this. Like, no. They all have their own individual cases that are so good. Mm -hmm. But – I think if I had a vote this year, my MVP would actually be Luka Doncic. <laughs> okay, okay. Who did you pick? My MVP is Luka Doncic. <laughs> I was I, – I the last – I was telling you before we started recording, right, I put this together mm. in preparation for this episode a couple weeks ago, just first thoughts, laid everything out, and I had the order. Jokic – Luca Shea. And I felt very comfortable with that at the time. Um, and I just really liked the last couple of days, sat back, thinking a lot, going back through the whole year. And one of the biggest things that, that stood out to me is when I, I think Luca, I think Jokic is the best player in the NBA. And we've I been agree. saying that for a couple of years now. I think Luca had the best individual season this year. I think I that him putting up essentially 34, basically 10 assists and 9.2 rebounds while also averaging what I believe is a career high in steals. Uh, definitely a better defender, probably his best defensive season. Not probably, I think it was his best defensive season in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of that has to do with the complimentary pieces around him. Um, and he was able to engine this team in the back half of the season all the way to ultimately finishing up with 50 wins. And what we're going to keep saying it is a loaded Western Conference. Um, and they end up at the five seed. On top of the fact that they dealt with so many injuries this year, um, they were one of the most injured teams this season. He just – is one of the most gifted offensive players in NBA history, bar none. And I think what really put it over the top for me is I sat here and I thought about, okay, if this isn't Luca's MVP season, and I know this might not be the best way to think about it, but again, you have to really split hairs when we're getting this marginal because, again, I, I think from what I've seen so far and like the early votes that have come out, Jokic is probably going to win this award. 1,000% deserves to win this award, too. Like, like I said, I had Jokic as my MVP 
for a good chunk of the season. And I 100%, I could make a full blown argument like I am right now for Yoko to win some more too. But if with the numbers that I just said, the 34, 10, and 9, 50 wins in this Western Conference, like what more could Luca do? Right. So, like, if this isn't the, the MVP stat line from a numbers perspective, you want to get on the advanced stats, like some people do have done in the past for Jokic as much. Like, I've gone through and looked at a bunch of advanced stats, EPM, box score plus minus, like a whole bunch of them. Luca is right there. Like, Jokic might be ahead of him, but Luca is there. The eye test is obviously like leaps off the page for Luca. Um, so, I was back and forth a ton, but I ended up leaning with Luka Doncic for my MVP pick. Yeah, man. I agree. I'm not going to lie. I really thought she was going to say Jokic. I don't know why. I just had a feeling he, I thought she was going to say Jokic. If we would have recorded yesterday, I, I might have. Like, genuinely, <laughs> it's that it was that close. Like, yeah. I was debating up until, like I said, 30, 45 minutes ago. And even as I was just going through that, as he was doing the intro, I'm like, maybe it is Jokic. Like, it's such a tight, tight race. Like, I said, I mentioned earlier, like if they could give out two awards this year, I, I wish they could, bro. Because both of them are unbelievable, and you could put together incredible MVP cases for both of them. So my reasoning is pretty much similar to what you were saying. I mean, the biggest thing with Luca has always been the wins, right? He's always, I mean, he always have had MVP numbers. He just mm-hmm. hasn't had, you know, the the team success overall to back them up. And my biggest thing was. Like stats wise in general, just the you know the regular counting stats. He's stats are insane. What is it? It's like four thirty four and almost ten assists and nine rebounds. Like it's insane. Then believe shooting his career high and his three point percentage like thirty eight percent on ten threes a game. Like the stats are insane. Granted, it's the same for Jokic as well. Like Jokic's stats are also insane. Right. But the biggest thing is you know the fifty wins. Like I said, in a stacked Western conference, stacked Western conference. Now, granted. In a normal year, if you want to say, yeah, uh, Jokic is a two seed, the Mavericks got the five seed, um, I'd hear you out. And you still could have that case, but it's like 100%. the five seed has 50 wins this year. So it's not like right. it's a it's a huge drop off. So for me, um, it's the team success, um, him turning around the team, like you said, them dealing with injuries, him having another big thing to me was him having a bunch of MVP moments this year, mm-hmm. like scoring, I believe, what was it, 70 points in a game this year? 73. Like 73. The uh, countless ridiculous stat lines, the ridiculous games. Like he's had an MVP level season through and through. Um, so I just feel like to me, kind of like to me, the biggest thing that you said that I agree with you was like, if not this year, then when? Because right. it's like th- this is an MVP level season to me. Like, and I just feel like for me personally, I could be biased because every year he's been in the league, I've been like, I'm picking him to win MVP at the start of the <laughs> season. But this is the first year where I'm like, okay, he legitimately, I feel like, has the best case to win it. Granted, like Jokic, there's not an anti-Jokic take. Like he, if he Jokic wins it, it's not like oh my god, Luca got robbed. But to me personally, I just think that Luca, like you said, had the best season this year. So to me, I would give it to Luca. Um, like you said, I do see as well that I feel like Jokic is probably gonna win it. Um, mm-hmm. just based off of all the stuff that I'm seeing, which is very interesting considering like that voter fatigue. Well, I was gonna say the voter fatigue hasn't really kicked in. But again, then again, it kind of did last year when Embiid right. won it. And now they're probably like, okay, we didn't get it to Loka- Jokic last year. We should probably give it to him this year. But, I mean, I know that plays a factor into it. And I guess another thing, honestly, that I was thinking about was, like, before, the, like, beginning of the season, like, as crazy as how uh, as crazy as the MVP race is that we're talking about right now and how close it is between three of these guys, two, but even three of these guys, including Shea, Beginning of the season, like Embiid was actually running away with it, and it was not close. Mm-hmm. And if you really think about it, it's like Embiid averaging about like thirty-five points a game. Um, you know, I believe he dropped what he dropped seventy in a game as well against the Spurs yeah. this year. Like Luca's kind of done the same thing, but it's not as hyped up as in the beginning of years when uh, Joel Embiid was kind of making his dominant run. You know what I mean? I feel like Luca's been right. just as dominant, have just as crazy moments, but it's not getting as hyped i want to say is like as to when joel and b was doing it in the beginning of the season but i guess that's another thing that kind of ties into it as well i just think that this season overall for luca has been an mvp level season first in the league he's gonna he won the scoring title like i said 33.9 so basically 34 points a night 
second in assists only to Tyrese Halliburton per game. He was 15th in rebounds per game. I actually ended up being 16th, um, but I'm pretty sure all 15 people in front of him were centers. So right. <laughs> um, nearly triple-double averages at, you know, again, almost 34 points a night. Um, six straight 30-point triple-doubles this season as well. That was an NBA record. Just – you mentioned it, the MVP moments. He had 50 and 15 on Christmas. He put up a 29-point triple-double in the first half earlier this year. Just unbelievable video game numbers from him all year. On a nightly basis, he pulls out a couple of passes that would be some of the best passes in NBA history for a lot of other players if they were on their mixtapes. Like, he is unguardable at all three levels. He's one of the most unique players in terms of using his body and, and his pace and the deceleration, like, he he just is having, and I well not having, it's over had to me what I think is the best individual season this year. So yeah, that's why I ended up getting my pick. That's why I ended up getting your pick. Um, to briefly touch on Jokic, I don't want to spend too much time, so I know we have a whole bunch more to go through. But the biggest case for him, again, obviously tied for the Thunder uh, for having the best record in the West. Um, the biggest thing with Jokic, as it always is, his on off his on off numbers. Visually, just when you watch the Nuggets, when Jokic is on the court versus off the court, they are a completely different team. And then, like the numbers are so staggering to look at. Like Luca is in the ninety sixth percentile in on off uh, plus minus. Like they're I think almost twelve points better per one hundred possessions when Luca's on the court. Again, ninety sixth percentile. The Nuggets are almost 24 points better plus one for per 100 possessions when Jokic is on the court. Like they I'm are like crazy, legitimately a 100 percent different team. Him yeah. offensively, everything, everything that the Nuggets do uh, runs through Jokic. I've like, and I think it almost is. Not fatigue in some aspects, but we talk so much about how well put together this team is around Jokic. But some of these guys, like Aaron Gordon was, he didn't have a defined role in Orlando. Like he got to Denver and became the Aaron Gordon we know that he is. Michael Porter Jr. was a huge question mark because of his injuries. Like Jamal Murray had injuries. He's had the up and down regular seasons. We know what he can be in the playoffs. Um, like KCP's role, we know he was able to do with the Lakers. That was like a great plug and play. Obviously, they lose Bruce Brown, like, but now you see the emergences of guys like Peyton Watson and a guy like Christian Brown. Like, Jokic's ability to elevate everyone around him is like second to none. It is like among some of the best that we've ever seen in NBA history. So, like I said earlier. If the award goes to Jokic, if it goes to Luka, like you're gonna have, I'm gonna have zero issue with it. I think they are both 100% deserving. I flip flopped multiple times um, coming into making a final decision because, it honestly, this feels like the tightest MVP race in a long, long time. This late into the season to really be trying to to have to really split hairs to pick one or the other. Yeah, I, I was, that's why I kind of think it's interesting how, like, um, like you said, you know, said it can go to either person, but I feel like, I feel like it's going to go to Jokic. Like, I don't feel like in the media's eyes, it's a toss up as much as like yeah. everyone else is making it out to seem. I feel like that's very interesting to me. I think a lot of people lean on the fact that because it's so tight, they immediately default to okay, well, you you know, the Nuggets won seven more games. They were more consistent throughout the season on top of Jokic's complete built out MVP case, um, his ability to just be unstoppable. All the things that Jokic is the best player in the world for. So mm-hmm. it's like to their nitpicking for a lot of them are the fact that they won seven more games. I even yeah. saw Tim Legler earlier on ESPN say the exact same thing. He thought individually Luka Doncic had the best season out of anybody, but 
when you have two guys who MVP, whose MVP cases are so good that it's almost it's literally basically a tie to try to figure out who's better. He was like that six or like six or seven more wins is a sizable gap. The five seed and a tie for the one seed is a sizable gap. And he ended up giving it that way. I mean, I guess you can never, like we said, you can never really get mad at giving the MVP to the literal best player on the planet. Like, right. Like if, if that's the default, like that's fine. You can never really get mad at that. Yeah. But like I said, toughest, toughest decision by far out of anything uh, on this list. So glad that we got that one through and out the way early. Um, Going to run through the rest of these here again. Not all of them were as cut and dry as probably the next two, um, but starting with defensive player of the year, basically was wire to wire this year, is Rudy Gobert. Best defense I in it the – I wanted it to be AD so bad. <laughs> I wanted it to be, but I, you just can't, bro. You just can't. It, it, I have the my, my full five here. Herb Jones slid in at, at fifth for me. Um, we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit more when we get to our all-defensive teams, but what he's able to do in New Orleans nightly is otherworldly, um, especially at, at his young age. I've got Bam Adebayo fourth. I've got Anthony Davis sliding at third. And then coming in as DPOY runner-up, was Victor Wembenyama? Who, mm. he, he made it. He made it a little bit closer than I was anticipating it being. Um, coming down the stretch because his raw counting stats are absurd. Bro. <laughs> like in yeah. limited minutes, like putting up over three and a half blocks a game is crazy. I, I don't have a top five. Um, I always have my all defensive team, but at least my yeah. top three was definitely. I just have AD ahead as far as the runner up and I have Wimby after that just because mm-hmm. I mean let's just be honest here because like you are you really want to say right, Anthony Davis I guess it leads to more wins but then again it's like if LeBron James was on the Spurs alongside of Wimby like how many wins would they have you know what I mean so mm-hmm. it's a little bit different because Wimby is legitimately playing with like G leaguers at times um his impact is still there so but to me I mean it is what it is. I just have Anthony Davis coming in at second, and I'll have Wimby at third. Yeah, but a- any way you slice it, it, it's it's hard to not, and really, in my opinion, impossible to not give this award to Rudy Gobert. Start to finish, they were the best defense in the NBA this year, um, despite shifting lineups and obviously Cat going out the last last couple of months. Um, he ended up being third in field goal percentage allowed. He was fourth in pick and roll defense, uh, ranked fifth in the league in isolation defense. He was sixth in total blocks, sixth in contested shots. He was 11th in defensive estimated plus minus. He was 19th versus drives. Like just a biggest thing for me that I saw from Rui this year on the defensive end, which is huge. And they, I've heard it touched on in interviews a couple times. He more comfortably this year than I think any other season jumped out to the perimeter multiple times I've seen this year um, and was able to still be an effective defender and not feel like he's a full liability if he ever has to step out of the paint, Hmm. Um, which he said coming into this season, he sat down with Chris Finch and said like, he does not ever want to get played off the court. Like don't pull him off the court. And Chris Finch was honest with him and was like, well, you've got to not be able to be played off the court. Right. Um, and so he he definitely made a conscious effort to get better in that aspect. So shout out to Rudy. This is going to put him in rarefied air um, to have another <laughs> defensive player of the year award. He's a Hall bro, of Famer, ladies and gentlemen. I was gentlemen. about to I say, not. bro, he's a Hall of – Rudy Gobert is a Hall of Famer, bro. That's mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah. That's crazy to think about, bro. Jesus yep. Christ. I, hey, man, I guess you can't really argue against it. It's just it is what it is. Yeah. It's hopefully it really- actually translate to the playoffs. I mean, I highly doubt it's going to be the same as when he was in Utah because Utah is a little bit different. You have no right. great defenders around you. Mm-hmm. This like this way, it's going to be a little bit different, but it's just crazy to think about Rudy Gobert as a Hall of Famer, bro. Crazy, <laughs> crazy for sure. Um, but my runner up. And defensive player of the year, Victor Wembanyama. Uh, moving on to the next award, is the clear-cut rookie of the year. Does 
as great of a season as Chet had, as great of a season as the Thunder had, Wemby genuinely just put up one of the most ridiculous rookie seasons we've ever seen. Easily. His, I think I saw like the, whatever combination of however many points, rebounds, and blocks, and threes he had had never been done before in the NBA. Somebody took his averages and put them through basketball reference to see how many other people had done that. One, it was Kareem in like the <laughs> early 80s. Like, we've talked about Wemby a ton. We talked about him a ton prior to the draft last year. Hey, man, talk about it. And I still think we might have undersold, like, how good he is this early. I think the biggest – so, the biggest things were, and I think we were kind of in the same boat about this, was, bro, like – don't care how the offense looks the rookie year. Really don't. He's going to be an all-defensive player in his rookie year. Just off of size alone, he's going to be all-defensive right. player. Just off of defensive instincts, things like that. I We both did not expect the offense to be this, like, refined this early. 17 <laughs> points in three minutes? He turned into Steph Curry very quick. Bro, like, he, he looked like... How he looked on the videos online when he's playing overseas. Oh, I did not expect him to make it look that easy this early. Right. Like that was the biggest thing. So to me, like you said, one of the best rookie seasons we've ever seen. The craziest part about it is this is the worst you'll ever see when we ever be. <laughs> Which it's is literally only up from here. Bro, he is what 19, 20. Like guys don't hit their prime until what 27? Right. Bro, <laughs> come on. I want to say is go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say I want to ask you because uh, Derrick Rose, right, is the youngest MVP. I want to see exactly he was he was twenty two at the time. Like, is that in jeopardy? Like, is that a wild thought to even put out there that in two or three seasons, like he could be playing himself into the MVP conversation that early. Now, obviously, the difference is Derrick Rose had a great roster around him, and they were a high seed that allowed that you know type of conversation to happen for him. So it's really dependent on the Spurs as a team success. But from a projection standpoint, like, if, like you just said, this is the worst he'll ever be. How much he improved from in season, from the start of this season to now. Imagine what he's going to look at look like at the start of next season after a full NBA offseason. Like – we're not that far removed from him already being a top 10 player in the NBA. And then there's just that next little jump to him being the, in the conversation for one of the best players in the NBA. Like He's right there already. You know, that's not far off at all just because of his impact. Like, his impact offensively and defensively is going to be the reason why he'll be in those conversations so early. Like, it's – no. Because I already have this crazy rookie season. and. To be so young, like I said, the the team success will be the big thing as far as determining will will he actually be able to win an MVP award. But as far as like his individual talent, I'm not worried about it. As far as his impact offensively and defensive defensively, I'm not gonna be worried about it whatsoever. It's just a matter of like I said, the the team success. Can he build a team fast enough? And you don't even have to rush it, but like, can you build a team around him fast enough that will be able to you know get him those type of accolades? But as far as his actual like ability, no, it's not out of the question. Like. Bro, he could be, and I'm not predicting, but he could be, like, literally, like, a top three player in the league in, like, a few years. Just off of straight impact alone. Right. Yeah. Like, I'm just not, that's not far off whatsoever. We are witnessing, like, once in a generation type of stuff going on in here. Like you said, it's the worst he'll ever be. Yo, really quickly, though, would you take him or Devin Booker? Oh, yeah. All right. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> when we said that before the draft, y'all in the comments, talk, you're glazing. He hasn't played a game yet. He, he's 7'5". He need to put on weight. It's not going to trip up. Bro, shut <laughs> up. <laughs> People's getting mad because we would take 19-year-old Wimmy Yama doing this over 35-year-old Kevin Durant. Yes. Yes, I would. This, bro. And it's crazy because if us saying it now, it doesn't matter if we clip it, post it. It doesn't matter now because everyone's going to agree. Right. Giannis, Jokic, Luka. That's it. Right. I, 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 I sent the video of the Pat Bev saying the exact same thing. 
Yeah, and it was like, like maybe oh, yeah, a week ago. <laughs> Bro, and, and back then I said Tatum. Now look back at that. I'm no, I'm not taking Tatum over Wimby. <laughs> not at all. Giannis, Jokic, right. Luka. That's it, bro. That's it. No the, one else. The youth and the runway, like we just said, to him becoming potentially the best player in the league so fast and the championship window that that is going to set up for your franchise, as long as he can stay healthy, like, you you have to take that. You have to take that upside. It's crazy. I just think it's Ridiculous. so funny, bro. <laughs> yeah. Y'all are – we run in our victory laps on this one oh, yeah. ever, bro. 100%. Pre-draft, we were saying this, bro. 100%. Um, for what it's worth, obviously, I had Chet second, uh, Brandon Miller third, who had a, a again, not a, lo- a, a loud rookie season from a media coverage perspective, but um, played very, very, very well for Charlotte all season. Um, so definitely make sure you need to make sure he gets his flowers and we'll, we'll probably talk about him a little bit more once we get to the all rookie teams. Next award is most improved player. Um, it seems like Tyrese Maxey is going to be the runaway for this award. He's been the runaway betting favorite for months now at this point from a lot of the media discussions. It seems like it's just going to be Tyrese Maxey. He was not my personal winner. And again, a lot of that just has to do with how I historically view the award. I like guys who go from more undefined roles, role players, not having a ton of opportunity to getting that opportunity and like making the most out of it and turning themselves into a high caliber, you know, guy. Um, And so for that reason, my most improved player is Kobe White, who even in their last game of the season against the Knicks, was given the Knicks all they could handle. Um, he just has really transformed himself on the offensive end. Um, in that game, like I just mentioned against the Knicks, he ended up – he only missed six shots, had 26 points. Um, the jump from last season to this season for Kobe White, um, just for reference, like last year he was averaging 9.7 points and 2.8 assists. This year, he jumped up to 19.1 points and 5.1 assists and was a bright spot for a otherwise very lackluster season in Chicago, um, which will probably end here very soon um, when he <laughs> gets to the, the playing tournament. But he fits the mold for what I think of most improved player. Like Kobe White could have not necessarily fizzled out, but he could have never made that jump. Tyrese Maxey was on this trajectory. Like we saw this laddering up to that. Kobe White, this was not necessarily going to be in the cards for him to make that leap. But he was able to put the work in and come into this season with a renewed like hunger and sense of urgency. And obviously with the the opportunity that Zach Levine going down brought for him, like he's made the most of it this season um, and was was a, a great shot creator and scorer. Um, and, and at times, you know, initiator for this Chicago Bulls team. So, so he was my most improved player. I had Maxi in second, um, third place. I went with Jalen Suggs. Not a huge jump offensively from accounting stats wise, but I've talked about this earlier in the year. Just the way that he was able to find his role and his lane for this Magic team as a defensive scrapper and the impact that he has for that Magic team. Um, cannot go understated. So because basketball is not a one side of the floor game, like his leap defensively on top of some of the efficiency with his shooting um, offensively, I think he definitely deserved to get some love for the, the most improved consideration as well. Yeah, 100 percent. I hear what you're saying. I uh, I personally I went with Tyrese Maxey. Um, I just felt like from the start of the season all the way up until now, he's been very consistent in his jump. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with you as far as like you can predict this trajectory. But mm-hmm. even the fact that, you know, Joel Embiid got hurt, um, he already beginning the season had to step into that number two role, but then for most of the season had to be the number one over there. Um, put up great stats. The, had definitely a jump in pretty much all of his his stats um, from the previous year. To me, I just feel like the overall body of work over this season is enough for me to win, for him to win most improved player. Um, also, I do want to mention, did not meet the game's threshold, but Jalen Johnson definitely deserved to get some love because 100%. a jump, points jump from five points per game to 16 is mm-hmm. huge. Uh, two assists, four more rebounds. 
um, shooting 35% for three versus 28 over about like double the attempts. Like, yeah, didn't meet the game threshold, but definitely at least had to get like some sort of love and some sort of, you know, um, recognition for his jump this season. 100%. And in that same vein, I have a note here too. Uh, he fell two games short, but Alperin Shingun also, if he was right, right. Threshold, would have gotten mm-hmm. a lot of consideration from me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked about the Rocks a ton, so we don't have to, to go into it too much, but just the leap that he's made as a hub for that team and the the promise that he brings for Houston moving forward, like 100% would be in consideration if he had hit the threshold. Absolutely. Next award we have here is sixth man of the year. Um, third place, I ended up putting Bobby Portis. Second place, I went with Nas Reed, who's been phenomenal for Minnesota off the bench all year. But ultimately, my winner was Malik Monk. And a lot of that just has to do with just the way that he can come off the bench. And it, I don't even want to say at times, because I feel like that's underselling it, because a lot of times he comes into the game and changes the game for the Kings. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, did start in all his games this year from off the bench, all 72 of them, um, you know, 15 points, three rebounds, a big jump in uh, playmaking for him, averaging over five assists this year. Um, he had a phenomenal season. The impact, the energy that he can bring off the bench, the scoring punch, and I, I, I just mentioned the playmaking creation for, for others in, in Sacramento. Um, he's been the most impressive player off the bench for me all season, so I have, I have Malik Monk. Completely agree. I have the same exact one, two, three, and then it's Malik Monk for me. Like I said, the spark off the bench, the energy that he gives, the 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 impact that he provides, like it's Malik Monk for me. Yeah, he is. It sucks that he might not get another chance to play with the Kings this season, especially if they don't get out of the playing tournament because it looks like he's still a couple of weeks out yeah. from, from being able to make it. But he had a, a phenomenal season for Sacramento. It's great to see the career resurgence that he had after coming off of a, you know, kind of a prove it deal that he took with the the Lakers a couple of years ago. Like it seems like he's really found a home there in Sacramento. So, so shout out to Malik Monk. I never wanted him to leave the Lakers. That was the one <laughs> bright spot of that season was Malik Monk. I swear to God, like everyone else sucked, <laughs> but it, Malik <laughs> Monk was the one bright spot in that team. Yeah. He, uh, he's been moving differently in Sacramento. Absolutely. Um, Quick one to get through because I this this award is still such an interesting one to pick. Clutch player of the year. Um, I ended up going with DeMar DeRozan. And a lot of that just genuinely has to do with him being second in total clutch points. I think mean, he was at 182. Steph was at 189. Um, and they it, it's interesting because when you look at, at the most clutch players, right? Like by NBA clutch statistics, I think it's uh, the last five minutes in the game has to be within five points, I believe. Um, the Bulls ended up playing 40 games in clutch time. Um, and in those 40 games, they won 24 of them. Um, one of For any of the guys who are up this high in terms of total um, clutch points, they far and away had the highest win rate um, out of those those players up here as efficiency is great. Um, 48% from the field in the clutch, 46% from three, almost 88% from the free throw line. Um, and he's a plus 94 in the clutch this season. So, um, you know, he has the moniker king of the fourth quarter for a reason. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the tough shot making, which lends itself perfectly to end of the game. Climb is running out. you got to get a shot up. Post moves, fade away, tough pull up. Demar Rosen got all of that, so that's my pick for clutch player of the year. I forgot about this award. <laughs> to be honest with you, hundred percent. I, I put together. I Loki still don't even like. I get it, but like I still don't at the same time. So yeah. we're just gonna pilly, piggyback off of what you said and go Demar <laughs> Rosen because like this award still to me is like, uh, sure, yeah, whatever. I honestly I don't remember when was the first year they implemented this. Last year, De'Aaron okay, Fox that's won. why I was about to say. Right. Like, I swear, this is like I don't remember Clutch Player Award years yeah. ago. So when yeah, it is when they did all of the award rebrands and changed the design, and everything they added Clutch Player in. Uh, other people I considered, obviously Steph, like I just mentioned, um, SGA as well, Jalen Brunson, both huge big time shot makers for their teams in the Clutch. So all guys that got consideration. There's no like. There's no criteria specifically for any of these awards, but this one feels the most loose to try to put together 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up going with DeMar. Uh, coach of the year. Um, I Third place, I ended up giving it to Tom Thibodeau for the job that he did in New York this season, especially amongst all of the injuries um, that they've had this season. Ended up with two seed out east. Second place, I gave it to Chris Finch. Did a phenomenal job wire to wire. Again, we talked about them already having the best defense in the NBA, um, and they net out with a three seed out west. But my winner was Mark Dagonal of the Oklahoma City Thunder. Took a team that did not make the playoffs last year and got them to the one seed. And like we mentioned again, a ridiculously loaded Western Conference. Just a great job start to finish um, with that roster and what he's been able to do on both sides of the floor. And honestly, one of the most impressive things, understanding their biggest weaknesses and utilizing that to their strength in some aspects, understanding that they're smaller, understanding that they're going to get punished um, on the interior, but flip side, turning them into one of the best, I think actually the best from a percentage and efficiency standpoint, shooting teams um, and phenomenal on the defensive side of the ball. So um, Mark Dagonal gets my vote for coach of the year and he just won the the coach of the year award that's voted on just by the coaches. So definitely has a lot of peer respect around the, the association as well. Absolutely. Um, to me, my third would be Chris Finch. My second actually would be Joe Mazzula. Just, just strictly just because like they won what 64 games. 64 I just feel like games. I got to give them some sort of credit. Mm-hmm. Granted, it's a little, a little bit different because coach of the year is normally like a, you were, either expected to be like down here and now you're up here or it's like no one expects you to do anything and then you ended up being really really good so that's right. why i don't have domas winning it but i just feel like for the season that the Suss has had he at least had to get some sort of credit about it um but yeah mark dagonal i feel like i always mess his name up but absolutely is the coach of the year um like i said the biggest thing was taking an okc team who i believe was in the play in last year mm-hmm. um obviously you know added in chat but it's like no one really expected that to be enough to catapult them in a tough Western conference to the one seed um, and him for able to be able to take a super young team in order to be the top of that seed with all these teams in the Western conference being so good. I feel like he has to be the coach of the year. Yeah. Phenomenal job to him. Shout out to him. Shout out to Jamal Mosley too. Like again, I've met, I talked about him a ton, but just what he's done in Orlando to get that team to the five seed um, is a great job. You mentioned Joe Missoula. It's tough, like you said, when the expectation was for them to be the best team in the East or at least mm-hmm. the second best team. And they had more 30 point wins and they had 10 point losses all season. That's why, to me, it wasn't, it's not even the fact that they're the one seed. It's the fact that they're 14 games up on the two seed. Yeah. Like it's the how, how high up, how high they are up there in the, uh, yeah. at the one seed. That's the biggest thing for me. No, he definitely deserves his flowers uh, for sure. Cause, you can say what you want about the East being weaker than the West. Like they stomped out the competition most nights, um, have one of the best net ratings in NBA history because of that. They did um, their so job. Shout out to Handle them. business. Yep. Um, let's go to the all rookie teams, and then we'll do all defensive wrap stuff up with the all NBA teams. So starting off with the all rookie team, obviously have on my first team the rookie of the year, Victor Wembanyama, my pick, um, Chet Holmgren. Brandon Miller, there is no uh, games requirement also for the all-rookie teams, too. So I do have guys on here who definitely did not play 65 games. Mm -hmm. Um, I have Jaime Jaquez and Amen Thompson to round out my first team. Uh, Who do you have on your first team? We'll we'll go team by team. Hold on. Say your first team again. Uh, Wemby, Chet Holmgren, Brandon Miller, Jaime Jaquez, and then Amen Thompson. Okay, got you. My first team is Wimby, Chet, Brandon Miller, Amon Thompson, Derek Lively. I flip flopped uh, with Derek Lively and Amen Thompson back and forth a couple of times. I did. Well, well, ult- this. Yeah, well, <laughs> ultimately did it for me. Um, and again, I'm not gonna super nitpick either way. I just really the the addition of Gafford. Um, really ate into Derek Lively's role a little bit, which we knew it would, and I think that's beneficial for the team, mm-hmm. and especially the back half of the season, Men Thompson's role really grew um, with the Rockets. Um, I just love what he brings on the defensive side of the floor. I love what he brings as a connector. If he can ever just get a semi-decent three ball, bro. Give me something, bro. Right. I think I saw yeah. – when I was doing all my research for this, I think he ended up finishing the season at 19.8%. So <laughs> – 
hopefully it'll get there. But uh, yeah, I went back and forth with them. My second team, uh, Derek Lively, again, who was very close to, to be on the first team for me. AirPods, great connector for Golden State this year. Uh, Keontae George, we know he's an absolute bucket. I didn't catch a ton of Utah games, but the ones that I did, Keontae George is always somebody that I'm looking out for. Um, and then the last two guys I have here, I gave a nod to a guy who basically did not play the first half of the season. But I, I – I could not not have Gigi Jackson on one of my all rookie teams. <laughs> um, this dude is a shooter, bro. He's Man. got a burner on him, um, and he just seems like just a good, a good kid, bro. And he obviously the the injuries gave him the opportunity to even be playing for Memphis this season, and he's made the absolute most of it. I think he ended up finishing the season at uh, averaging over fourteen a night. Mm. Um, had 30 point game. He had a 40 point game. Like when he gets hot, he can really take over a game from a scoring perspective. And with the last slot on my second team, I actually went with another Warriors player. I gave it to Trace Jackson Davis. The versatility that he can provide as a five man for the for Golden State this year to me did not go unnoticed. Um, him on the defensive end, his hustle, uh, and then obviously him as a screen and roller. Um, he, he fit in very well with that second unit, um, has a great two man game with Draymond, with Clay, with Steph, um, and then again, AirPods as well. So I, I gave the nod there to Trace Jackson Davis. Um, I had like a small honorable mention section. Case and Wallace was great all year for, for OKC as a, um, a floor spacer, very efficient shooter, and then he had a great impact defensively. Cam Whitmore was great in the back half of the season for the, the Rockets, and I think he's going to continue to to grow into his role and really regret – make other teams regret passing on him in the draft. Yeah. Um, and then got to give love to Scoop, bro. It was an ugly rookie season, and that is a big reason why I couldn't fit him onto one of the all-rookie teams. But um, he started to look a lot better towards the end. The Trailblazers team as a whole – is bad, so he cannot place it all on him. And we know it takes a long time for guards to be able to really get fully comfortable um, adjusting to the NBA speed. But it looked like we saw some flash of that, uh, especially towards the end. I think he's the only rookie this year to have a 20-point 10 assist game. I think he ended up doing that four times. So he'll get better. You got to be patient with him. But he definitely uh, you know, got a little bit better as time went on. So I'm excited to see him kind of grow as we get into that second season in Portland, but could not, could not get him on the, the all rookie team, but I had to make sure Gigi Jackson was up there. <laughs> no, nah, I feel you. Gigi Jackson's on mine as well. Um, I have Jaime Jaquez. That's why I flipped with Derek Lively. was going back mm-hmm. and forth with, um, I do have AirPods. Um, I have Keontae George and I also, he had, I'm not gonna lie. He did have a bad rookie season, but because of the flashes towards the end, I gave Scoot the nod. It's hundred percent fair, hundred percent. Honestly, because I feel bad a little bit. I'm like, bro, this is, well, third overall pick. It started off very, very like was like you can't even think about being on this list. But then right. again, like you said, showed flashes, got better towards the end of the season, and I believe in the overall talent. Um, and I believe that you know, obviously, it's gonna get way better than this. Um, but yeah, it's mainly off of the fact that later in the season he did show flashes, show some progression. So I'm, I gave him that nod that last spot. Yeah, he he, he definitely is deserving of it. Um, I'm happy that he finished up the season on the stretches that he did. And that, I hope that gives him some good momentum moving into uh, into next year. Next to the all defensive teams, which I'm so glad that these are positionless, bro, because finally, <laughs> Am Adebayo. <laughs> you know, first team, all defense alongside my defensive player of the year pick. So my full first team, Rudy Gobert, Victor Wembanyama, Anthony Davis, Bam Adebayo. And then on my fifth slot, like I mentioned in my DPOI voting, is Herb Jones, who just – he can disrupt an entire offense. And you have to give credit to somebody that's able to do that from the perimeter because of how difficult it is to be an elite perimeter defender in the NBA um, in this era of basketball. And he's able to use his length so well to be in passing lanes. Um, He's, he, he can do it, 
both guarding on the ball and off the ball. He can be a disruptor in passing lanes, but he also can just rip you up if you're trying to dribble in his face. Mm-hmm. He can recover uh, defensively on the backhand. is a great weak side uh, help defender to come over at the rim as well. Like He has really very little flaws in his game defensively. Um, and most nights takes the best uh, challenge for New Orleans, um, you know, whoever whoever they're playing that night. Um, so I had to give Herb the nod for, for first team all defense. Yeah, we got the same list. Uh, same thing. I have Gobert, I have Anthony Davis, I have Wimby, Bam, and I have Herb Jones for all the same reason that you said. I feel like Gobert, AD, and Wimby were locks. Um, Bam, obviously, his versatility and the fact that he does mostly everything for for the Heat um, covers a lot of things up for them. And then, like I said, for the same things about Herb Jones, I had to get him on the first team all defense. Like, yeah. I like watch Herb Jones play defense, bro. He just, bro, the guys with like that build. It's just a, if you got the want to and you have that like athletic build that you can, you know, really sit in the chair and like lock up but still be lengthy and tall enough to really defend, it's it's a cheat code, bro. It really is. So definitely had to give him that nod. Yeah. And I, I'm quickly going to give flowers to Bam. And I, we've, we've said it probably before on the pod, but just he unlocks so much of what the Heat are able to do defensively, why they can switch up so many coverages, because he can play drop, because he can play zone, because he can come out. And if they want to switch everything, he's very comfortable switching one through five. Like, he can unlock so much for Miami. Um, netted out being fifth in the season in defensive estimated plus minus. Was top 15 in pick and roll defense, 22nd in isolation defense. Uh, top 25 in field goal percentage allowed at the rim. Um, just... He doesn't always put up ridiculous raw stats if you're only looking at blocks and steals. But when you watch the Miami Heat play, his defensive impact is it jumps off the screen. So I'm so glad he can get first team all defensive uh, selections now that it's positionless and he's not going to be stuck behind Rudy. And if it was just uh, if it was this year, he probably wouldn't make it at all because they would have Rudy and they would have Vic, and he's just the odd man out. You know, it's crazy. Bam is never going to win a deep play. Ever no, in his no. Career. Should have never it's played the same time as one beat. Bro, he's, ne- he's <laughs> never going to win one, bro. <laughs> like, ever. His yeah. best chance was the Marcus Smart year. That was it. No. That's yeah. Damn. That's, that sucks. Super Hopefully he's not, like, a forgotten, like, uh, when people look back and just look at, you know, like, accolade and stats yeah. or just, like, stats and people be like, hey, he was all right defender. Hopefully he's not just straight up forgotten like that because I feel like he might be one of those guys where you kind of had to just watch – and see the impact, you know what I mean? Because he's not going to have a deep boy. He's going to have all defensive selections, but that's looking back on it, it's like I feel like it might not have the same impact as far as, like, what he actually did on the court. Yeah, and this is somewhat related, but a couple of – might have been almost a month ago now at this point when Anthony Edwards had the, the game-saving block. Um, I saw a lot of people in the comments. I was like, well, what is what do y'all think is the most – you know, the, the, the best block of the last was like, or in NBA history, maybe. And I was like, you get the ant block that one. You obviously have the block by James. You've got Giannis blocking the DeAndre in lob. One that flies under the radar and I don't see nearly enough. And a lot of people did mention Bam out of bio blocking Jason Tatum at the rim in the finals, uh, mm-hmm. in the bubble when his wrist bent Man, back wrist like this. Back. Yeah. That's a ridiculous play, bro. You know ridiculous why they don't give it? Ridiculous play. You know why they don't give it credit? Where were they playing at? And people hate it. People act like bubble basketball was just a, a fever dream, bro. Like yeah. people act like it was not real. When in reality, if you put the hate aside, it has some crazy moments in the bubble, bro. Not just mm-hmm. like tips in general. It has some crazy moments, and that block was one of them. Yeah, it was it was ridiculous. Um for my second team, I have Alex Caruso, I have Jalen Suggs, I have Derek White. I have Shea Gilgis Alexander, and then for my last spot, I was so tough to pick. I you could give it to like six or seven different guys. I honestly ended up going with Isaiah Hartenstein, uh, and a lot of it has to do with just he, without Mitchell Robinson, is anchoring up the Knicks defense, which is the huge part of their identity. He ended up being first in defensive estimated plus minus. Again, higher than any other player, even Rudy or Vic. 
Um, he was first in isolation defense, only giving up 0.7 points per possession. He was sixth in field goal percentage allowed at the rim. He was eighth in pick and roll defense. Uh, let had I think he's 18th in the league in blocks. Uh, he had a very underrated season. Another guy you could probably even possibly consider for most improved because of how much um, he jumped on that side of the ball and offensively. Some people like to include rebounding in, in defensive talks. Like he's a phenomenal rebounder on that side of the floor as well. Um, so he ended up getting the nod, but like you could literally put Drew or J.D. McDaniels, you know, A.G. or KCP in Denver, Chet, Lou Dort, like a lot of guys who could definitely 100 uh, percent deserve an all defensive nod, but ended up going with with SGA and Hardenstein as my last two slots on my second team. You know, I uh, my second team, I have Alice Caruso. I have Jalen Suggs. I have Derek White. And then I put Chet in there. Um, I definitely mm-hmm. wanted to get at least someone from OKC. I chose Chet just because for most of the year, he was pretty much the only big on that team. And the stats were great as far as I believe it was about over like two blocks a game. Um, yep. Led a top five like defense, at least in defensive rating. Just uh, overall, I felt like I at least had to get someone from OKC in there. And I wanted to, to I wanted Chet to at least get some love. And then my fifth spot, I'd have J.D. McDaniels. But yeah, it was a, it was a lot of guys that was going back and forth with. Because, like you said, it was at least what, six, seven more people that, if you said their name in here, would have not right. even been surprised whatsoever. Yeah, and n- not at all. Because Jaden McDaniels is the guy who's not going to, like, if you just look at the advanced stats, his advanced stats are not going to leap out as high as some of the other players. Um, but you also have to consider, again, he's taking on the best assignment mm-hmm. every single time the Temple will step on the court. He's guarding Kevin Durant and LeBron's like those are his nightly assignments. He picks that up every single time. Um, and he defends at a very, very high level and is a big contributor to why that Temple's defense was was number one in the NBA wire to wire this year. So a guy who like he was very hard to leave off of this list. Um, again, the guy I really consider for for one of those last two slots. Bro, this year they could have had like a th- third team all defensive team <laughs> just to get some guys there yeah. that probably deserve it like they could have really did that yeah it's, literally i have under a second team i just said that was like tough cuts honorable mention i have seven players here like you could have <laughs> a full third team all defensive team and all the, it doesn't feel like you're just like giving this away to anybody it's like right. everything is deserved mm-hmm. um but with that that brings us to the last portion which is our all nba teams I'll get my first team out of the way. It's my one through five in MVP voting. It is Luka Doncic, Nikola Jokic, Shea Gildas Alexander, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and Jalen Brunson for my last slot on first team All NBA. Again, that was tight between him and Tatum, but just this last stretch of the season with OG in and out, with no Randall, the performances that Brunson had. Um, for the Knicks on a nightly basis, just I, I, he deserves to be first team All NBA in my opinion. Um, so that's how that that ended up shaking out for me. Yeah, no, I'm not mad at it. I uh, I have Shea, I have Luca, I have Giannis, and I have Jokic. But instead of Brunson, I do have Tatum. Um, Brunson is definitely a guy that was tough leaving off the first team All NBA because of the season they did have, because of the context, because of the injuries. Um, but I just also just feel like Tatum, obviously, you know, stats wise, it's not going to be nothing crazy considering, you know, they have an all star starting five. It feels like they have an insane starting five in the point where anyone on any given night can pop off for 30. Um, but I just feel like being the best player on that type of team, leading that charge, being that guy over there, because there's still no question he is the go to guy over there. I just feel like he at least deserves. Um, he at least deserves credit for leading that team for to such a good record. So I chose mm-hmm. to give Tatum that nod. Hundred percent fair. Tatum was the the first guy I have on my second team to round out my second team. I have LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Anthony Edwards, and then for my last slot, I went with Kawhi Leonard to round out my second team. Um, so two Lakers, both of them sliding here at the second team. Absurd that LeBron. In year was it year twenty one or whatever it is now, mm-hmm. at age thirty nine, is playing like one of the ten best players in the NBA. Um, 
even all the way through the very last game of the season. We have 13 first half assists yesterday. 14, I he's, think. No, no, you're right. 13. It was 13. He's ridiculous, bro. This the we I ended up finishing uh what did he average wise? He shook out to what 20 was it 25 9 or 25 7 and 9? Let me see. I have pulled up 25.7 points, 7.3 rebounds, 8.3 assists. Um stupid, stupid averages for a 39-year-old NBA player. You're ridiculous, um, bro. Yeah, he, he ended up making it onto my my second team. So yours was say it again for me. Uh, second team, I have Tatum, LeBron, Anthony Davis, Anthony Edwards, and then Kawhi Leonard. No, Kevin Durant. You didn't have one. Or? Kevin Durant did not make my second team. He, I, I, he was one of the last people I flip flopped. Okay. From second team to third team. Okay, so I have I have Brunson um, instead of Tatum because I have Tatum on the first team. Then mm-hmm. I have also I have Anthony Edwards. I have LeBron. I have Anthony Davis, and then I have KD instead of Kawhi. Um, so why KD over Kawhi? I have KD over Kawhi just because KD, obviously the Suns have been a little eh this year, just as a team Mm -hmm. overall, but I just feel like KD as an individual performance has been playing great, especially for his age. Um, I feel like he's been able to step up and granted the Suns are not a good, not a good overall team. I don't feel like, but at least he tries his best to fill in those weaknesses that they do have, whether it be certain times where, you know, he has to get down there and rebound certain times where he has to, you know, play some defense, rim protect a little bit. And then obviously when he has the night, when he has it going, he's able to, you know, beat Kevin Durant and score. Um, mm-hmm. So again, it hasn't led to the best season, especially considering the expectations they had this year. But also when you factor in the fact that at least beginning of the season, like Bill, Bill was out for a little while. Book was out for time from time to time. They haven't always had the big three in there. I feel like KD has been, very consistent in that aspect. I believe he played over 70-something games. I can't really remember. Um, but ultimately, to me, I feel like that's the reason why I gave KD that nod, just because mm-hmm. he's at least trying his best to be more of an overall player and help out the team when it needs – and the areas that he needs it. No, fair. It's 100%. Like I said, I flip-flop back and forth between two. Um, both of them had, you know, super efficient seasons – um, Katie shot 52% from the field, 41% from three. Kawhi ended up shooting basically the exact same uh, shooting splits, 52.5% from the field, 417 from three. Um, he was 1.5 percentage shorter of being 50, 40, 90 from the free throw line. Um, to me, just his, his ability to, and not to say that Kevin Durant can't do this, like it's his ability to be able to, get his shots off in the mid range. It feels like when the Clippers need them the most on top of um, the defensive impact that he's still able to make this late in his career, um, you know, after all of the the nagging injuries, like Kawhi still has those moments where he'll sit in that chair and just really like hone in on the defensive side of the ball and tap into him being the claw again. Um, and, and credit where credit is due, Kevin Durant, I think, played maybe his best defensive season of his career this year in Phoenix. I think that's gone kind of under the radar. Um, but but Kawhi is just a different animal on that side of the ball. And the, the that plus the production on the offensive edge was enough for me to give him the, the slight nod over KD to second team. I hear you. It was definitely a conversation because I definitely tried my best to get Kawhi. I felt like Kawhi could definitely be higher. Um, mm-hmm. like in making the second team, but ultimately it just didn't work out. It was just tough, uh, bro. It's stuff is tough, bro. It's tough because it you're it always is. gonna listen. You're gonna have at least a couple guys where somebody might look at my list and be like, "Bro, how do you have so and so not second team?" Like it's it, the NBA is too good, man. It's too good. Yeah, and what I love is that we're not every argument that we're making. Neither one of us is like. Well, he's not doing this and he's doing like it's you can build a case for somebody and not feel like you have to tear down somebody else's. It, yeah, it doesn't that, have it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have right. to discredit someone to talk someone right. else up. And that, that speaks against, like you said, just the overwhelming amount of talent that there is right now in the NBA and how well guys are playing. Um to round out my third team, 
Again, I, I have KD here. I have his teammate, Devin Booker. I have Steph Curry. I have Demonis Bonus. And with my last lot, I gave it to Jalen Brown because he just, on any given night, can be that guy for the Celtics. We know he can provide defensively. Um, his, his energy, his scoring punch is so vital to this team, especially in games where Tatum is struggling or they're just – their offense is looking a little sluggish. Like he can on any given night, like some people say, can be the best player on the floor for this Boston team. We already talked about them having 64 wins. Like they have to get two all NBA players. Like not that that should be the end all be all, but like that has to factor into it. Um, and, and obviously he's more well deserving of it, even outside of just his counting stats. Um, 23 points, five and a half rebounds, uh, 3.6 assists, 1.2 steals a game. Um, he just, it, it was tough. It was a tough decision for that very, very last slot. Cause again, I, and the people that I was deciding to, I could make a whole fourth team, all NBA. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I ended up going with Jalen Brown for that, that last 15th slot. So yeah, I have a I have Kawhi instead of KD. I have those two flip flop. But other than that, it's mm -hmm. the exact same. I have Steph, I have Devin Booker, I have Sabonis, and I also have Jalen Brown. To me, Jalen Brown honestly was a little easier than I like. Originally, I thought I was like ah, like when I was looking through the names, but when I think about it, I'm like, like you said, 64 wins. Um, his impact in the game. It's the fact that he steps up when needs to. Like he went on a stretch where obviously he's not the one over there, but he went on a little stretch where he was acting like he was the number one over there in Boston. Right. Um, defensively, I feel like he's really stepped up as far as his defense playing had a really good defensive season. Um, and the thing, same thing, like you said, it's not the end all be all, but like the Celtics should have at least two All NBA guys. I feel like. Yeah. So to me, it definitely was a little bit easier getting him in there. Um, a guy like Sabonis, I definitely wanted to get in. Book definitely deserved it. Um, like you said, Kawhi, I feel like has a case to be the second team over third team as well. So definitely wasn't sliding anywhere past third team. Um, yeah. So other than that, pretty much the same besides like Katie and Kawhi. Yeah. And the, the name that I wrestled with for that last slot, Zion was definitely 100% in consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, De'Aaron Fox is in consideration. Um, Tyrese Maxey was, was even in consideration potentially. I tried. Um, I thought about it, but it just, yeah. wasn't, it just wasn't gonna work with Maxi. I want. I actually really wanted to give him a nod, but it just it just wasn't gonna work, bro. Yeah. Um, Halliburton too. His his skid the back half of the season really hurt because it felt. Bro, you just said this around All Star break. It felt like he was a lock to be at least second team. At least, bro. I'm about to say, see. Listen, at one point, if somebody was like, yeah, he could possibly slide to in a, in someone's first team. It was, you know what I'm saying? They had a case, but like I said, the second half of the season was definitely a little little skittish. But am I crazy for like – he wasn't going to make it. But like Wimby, low-key, was like – I was, I was another trying Another name to, I was getting to is like he's there. He's, I was you, trying to – got to think. I, bro, he was definitely in the bump, like on the cusp. Like he was – I right. was trying my hardest to finesse it. Like I said, right now it's just – as great as a rookie season he had, it's just some of these guys are just, you know – uh, just a, a tad better as far as, you know, their play this year. But, I mean, as a rookie, you're not expected to be an all-NBA guy as a rookie. But I'll tell you one thing, I would bet if I'm a betting man, I'd bet he'd be on one of these teams next year. Oh, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. Um, But, yeah, there we go. We've gone through every single NBA award, every single NBA end-of-season team. Um, so to run through our winners one more time, MVP, both have Luca. Mm -hmm. DPOY, we both have Rudy Gobert. Rookie of the year, we both have Victor Wimbayama. Most improved player, I have Kobe White. You have Tyrese Maxey. Sixth man of the year, we both have Malik Monk, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, clutch player of the year, I had DeMar. We, we had DeMar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Coach of the year, we both had Mark Dagnall. Um, so a lot of similarities and obviously the variations between all rookie defensive and all NBA teams. But it's tough. It was tough to have to cut out 
MVP. Tough to have to put together the all NBA teams. There's just so much, so much talent. You got to be so nitpicky on what you what you value a little bit more. And so the last thing I'll say is the, the discourse is going to be toxic on Twitter for the next until the even after the award is announced, honestly. Um, but dog, if it's Luca, if it's MVP, if it's Shea, bro, they all deserve it, bro. So just let it be. Let it be. It don't have to be. I'm seeing Mavs fans talk about Luca's getting robbed. The media don't like the Mavs. Like, bro, don't I just like, told you. What? The media don't like, like the Mavs. What? I don't know, bro. I don't know. I was, I ended up in a Mavs Reddit doing research, and, like, they were up in arms about Jokic having more votes already announced for, um, you know, for the the official ballots. So, like. People swear that they like the media only has it out for their team, like the right. Dallas Mavericks. What do the Dallas Mavericks? No disrespect, but like have any reason for people to be like, "Nah, we're purposely not gonna like the Dallas Mavericks." Like, bro, what are we talking about, bro? This it's a fair no idea, bro. All right, just they're all more and more, more and well deserving. Um, like I said, this year was so hard to come down to pick to one. Uh, but with that, that brings us to the playing tournament. And we are here with, like I said, game starts tomorrow with the both Western Conference games. So the first one is going to be the 7 8 matchup. And then you have the 9 10 matchup. But let me just pull up the brackets. So I'm going through it. And honestly, let's just start with the East. So we can just get it out the way because I think it's going to be quick. And cut and dry. And actually, look, do you think the Hawks or the Bulls have a chance of coming out of this playing no. tournament? No. No, they shouldn't be here because they're behind by so many games. Anyway. I must say no, bro. The playing tournament is for the West. <laughs> it's not for the All East, right. bro. It's going to be the Sixers and, and the Heat. Uh, so, I don't care who wins Bulls, Hawks. I don't think they beat Sixers or Heat. Literally. Barring the only caveat if Joel Embiid is not healthy. But again, if that happens, then they have to play the Celtics. They're getting swept. Exactly. So we'll leave it like that. Um, Sixers Heat, let's say Embiid is healthy. Who do you like in that matchup to go and win? And then they would be taking on the Knicks in the first round. I like the Sixers. Um, With the healthy Embiid, like I said, the way Embiid was playing before he got injured was at the MVP level. Um, I just want him to be fully healthy, fully rested, um, to have, so they're really full strength. Like I said, Tyus Maxey steps up. I actually do trust his ability in games like this because even last year he definitely showed flashes of a guy who can step up in these high-pressure moments. Um, and the Heat really have not played good. <laughs> like they just if they mm-hmm. their if their name was the Bulls or something, like I feel like we would have a lot less respect for them. Granted, they've earned the respect, so it's you know what I mean it's warranted. But, like, if we're just going off strictly this year and the play, like, they really haven't played. They haven't done nothing for me to think that they're this top team that can really contend besides the fact that they are the Heat. And the last time they were the eighth seed, they went on the crazy Cinderella run. Um, That Heat culture always kicks in around this time. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, but if I had to pick one, I think I'd pick the 76ers. Yeah, I just looked it up. And B is still listed at day-to-day. He did practice today, so that's a very good sign. Um. If Embiid is playing, I've got Philly as well. Um, he just, even in the, the few games that he's played since he's been back, you can tell his his conditioning isn't there. His lungs aren't fully there yet, but he's still absurdly skilled. He's still doing Embiid-type things um, in the limited minutes that he was playing. Um, I just think that the, the Heat don't have great answers for Embiid. I don't know if anybody has great answers for Embiid other than Embiid beating himself sure. <laughs> sometimes. So, um, but but between him, between Maxi, um, Kelly Oubre has also been. I don't know if we even talked about it on the pod, but he's been great for Philadelphia all season. One of the most underrated free agent pickups this off season. Um, he he's done a ton for this team. His shooting brings life um, to the Sixers team at times. So. Um, I like Philly as well in that matchup. You know, we, I've been vocal about Miami. I think they'll win whoever comes out of that 9-10 game. If they don't, oh, boy, that is going to be embarrassing. 
I mean, hey, last year they was what about to lose that, that game, yeah, and then yeah. went on the run. So, like I said, the only reason why we still kind of you know you can never count out the Heat is because they are Heat, Heat culture. They've done this last year. They can never, never relax, bro. Which is crazy considering how the Celtics have won sixty four games, fourteen games over the two seed in their consolation prize or their prize is a heat team who's giving them problems all these years so yeah. that's kind of crazy to me yeah um it's tough and like i said it doesn't matter whoever comes into the eight seed whether that's any four of these teams the only one that i think could even give the celtics remotely trouble would be Philadelphia with a healthy Joel, and that would that would be a series. I would, but I'm still taking Boston. But that would be it. Would be unfortunate to be in Boston's position, and they've just slid so far because of Embiid's injury. But now he's back and healthy, and that's what you <laughs> got to play in the first round. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of that, I, I think Philly probably wins the first game. And, and Ducks and Celtics in the first round. And then if it's any of these other three teams, it should be Celtics in four. If it's Miami, it'll probably be Celtics in six because Spo gonna Spo gonna Spo to Heat gonna Heat. They're gonna get a couple. <laughs> they're gonna give their fans some hope, but I uh -huh. I don't think there's a word the, the world where the Celtics drop a series to the Heat where they shouldn't two years in a row. Hey man, you never know. He you gonna you, heat you Celtic, never do. Celtics, Celtics might Celtic. You never know. <laughs> they better not. Be I hope not. I'd be so I'd be so mad if this if the Celtics because I want to just see the best possible teams play. Mm -hmm. I would be so mad if they lose. I'm not even joking. I would Unless the Knicks make it the whole way, then you know what I'm saying I like the Knicks. I, I think, think the Knicks are going to the Eastern Conference Finals. I thought you was about to say finals. I'm about to be like, no, 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 no. I don't like, think yo. anybody's barring injury. I don't think anybody's beating Boston four times out of seven. I also think the Knicks are going to the conference finals. I guess that's a topic for later in the another pod, but yeah, I, I'm a I, I rock with this Knicks team, bro. I think they have. If we teams. had to rank teams that I trusted out east, it's Boston, it's New York. Facts. I don't have a lot of faith in Milwaukee, bro. Unfortunately, man, that's yeah, that's a tough one. Pivoting to the West, though, um, seven eight matchup. Going on tomorrow night is a rematch of the last game of the season. Lakers, Pelicans in New Orleans again. Um, winner of this game, your prize is you get to go to the Mile High City. Give us the Nuggets, man. Denver. Give us the Nuggets. We want the Nuggets, man. We want the Nuggets. I don't care. We want the Nuggets. Now, I did just see... Anthony Davis is was listed, I think, as questionable now for this game from the injury play. that he, he sustained. Uh, I don't even know. We haven't brought it up, but AD has had the most available season of his career, in a, at least in a very long time. And it's not getting talked about enough because a lot of y'all trying to clown him, street clothes Davis, day to Davis. But yeah. now when he's suing up, well, he played 70, 73 70. games this year. Yeah, I think it was our 70. It was 73 to 77, one of those two. Yeah. Like, bro, give him his flowers because y'all was really bashing him when when he was getting banged up with injuries here and there, bro. Mm -hmm. Now wow. everyone's silent. Now all the, all the haters are silent. They ain't saying nothing. It's crazy. And he said before uh, the season, like, my goal is to play all 82. He came damn close. He did. Um, but <laughs> – Hard to take the Pelicans in this matchup when we literally just saw this matchup on Sunday. And the Pelicans got the brakes beat off them. They got out, out physical. They got outpaced. They just got beat on every end of the floor from every which way. LeBron, like I said in the first half, 13 assists, controlled the game entirely, pushing the pace up the floor, you know, needle thread passes, getting it uh, – you know, quick start on the break. Really had a bunch of huge dunks in this game. The threes were flowing in. Like, everything was clicking for the Lakers. Um, so, I, I think L.A. is probably going to get it done. I've seen people flirt with the idea of, ooh, lose the first one on purpose so you don't no. got to play Denver. No. You, I promise you, you do, if Steph 
in the Golden State Warriors win that first game, you don't want to see Steph in a winner go home situation. Because if he bro. gets hot, that's that's it for you. You're going to Cancun, bro. So that nobody's nobody's intentionally losing a playing game. I'm not gonna lie. If we was in the East and it was the Hawks Bulls, I might hear y'all out. Yeah, you know I mean, if it was like if we were playing one of them at the nine ten, I don't want to play the Warriors and they want to go home. I damn sure don't want to play the Kings who beat us all, all year. Mm-hmm. No, bro. That's the that to me. That's one is mad scary. You telling me right. that? Listen, you want to avoid the Nuggets that bad that you're willing to lose your one advantage? We might as well have been the ten seed then. Like we right. want to lose our advantage. And risk our whole season because we want to avoid the Nuggets. That is just, bro. That legitimately, if they was to really, I know they're not. But if they was legitimately right. to do that, that would I would question my fandom for this team because that'd be not crazy. Fair. But no, bro, we're not. Come on, man, give us give us some Nuggets. We ain't scared of no Nuggets. What? Yeah. You, you said no it nuggets. best. You said it best the other day. Like to get out the West, you're gonna have to go through Denver anyway. Why Let's not get out the way now? But bro, because then don't like play with my heart, and you know what I'm saying we went through all these series, and then we get to the Western Conference Finals and get smoked. I truly feel like, and this is just, I mean, this is not Lakers fan. I'm gonna be for real for a second. The Nuggets are gonna win, but if you want your best opportunity to beat the Nuggets, if for an older Lakers team, as far as like AD and LeBron, just get them. It's funny because to say while well, you're most healthy when Anthony Davis just got hurt, but mm-hmm. I feel like he'll be fine. Just yeah. get him now before you know you're worn down from all these other series and. You know, then you got to go to Denver and play in the mile high. And it's like, listen, we just played two grueling series because I don't really see any world where I'm just looking at all the matchups in the West where um, if I'm speaking for the Lakers specifically, where you're beating anybody in damn sure not beating anybody in four. I doubt you'll beat anybody in five. Like you're not going to it's not going to be no cakewalk series anywhere. So I just get the Nuggets out the way because if you're going to beat the Nuggets, beat them. If you was going to lose lose now because you was going to lose later anyway. It really don't matter. So just get out the way. I hear you 100%. Um, so that then brings us to the 9-10 matchup. It's going to be in Sacramento. You know that crowd's going to be rocking. You know there's this low rivalry there between them and Golden State, not too far away in literal geographical distance. Um, they had a banger of a series last year. Took, what was it, 51 or 50 from Steph in that game okay. seven mm-hmm. um, to, to down Sacramento last year. Win or go home, which is crazy because the Kings felt like they were such a lot to be a top six seed. And they, this just goes to show you how ridiculously tight the West was. They took like three really bad losses in the last two weeks, and they're the nine seed. The margin crazy. of error was that slim and a couple of blown leads here, and they are now – Literally, their backs against the wall against the, the team in the West that's the most has the most championship experience. They're playing the the last dynasty um, with Steph and Clay and Draymond. Um, team who honestly, beat them last year, huh? Yeah, right. And this Golden State Warriors team has regressed <laughs> in a lot of different aspects. Win or go home, give me Steph. Give me Golden State. It's going to be such a ridiculous environment. But I just I, – I, the one thing I will say is Keon Ellis for Sacramento has been phenomenal the last month and a half, two months of the season. Um, and he's moved into the starting lineup now like Kevin Herter is out for the season. But – um, he, I think, can potentially provide similar impact to how we talked about Davion Mitchell last year, was able to disrupt Steph as much as you can disrupt Steph. Keon Ellis is going to be able to get up in his skin and just, you know, try to make him as uncomfortable as possible. But I ultimately, I think, with no Malik Monk, with no Kevin Herter, I, I just think it's going to be too difficult for them to keep up with the Warriors who, again, have been there, done that so many times. They're not going to be phased by the crowd. They literally went to y'all building in game seven last year, and Steph put up 50. And he knows what it's going to take to beat this team. And I think they'll probably do it again. If, if they were healthy, if they had Malik and, and Kevin Herter, I might feel a little bit differently. I don't think it's going to be a cakewalk for Golden State, and I don't think it's a free win at all. Like, I do think 
if Steph does not have a great game, like he, a lot was relying on him. If he, he can't come out slow, he can't come out flat because so much is, is based on him that they can definitely still lose this game. But if I had to be a bad man, if I had to put my money on it, give me Golden State <clears throat> against Sacramento, even if it's in Sacramento. That beam, that beam ain't getting lit that night. Yeah, man, it's certain. Uh, kind of like you kind of learn when you watch sports. You know, there's certain just greats that you just don't bet against unless they're going against other greats. Like you know, what I'm saying mm-hmm. Lakers, LeBron, things of that nature. But I don't know, man. It's just it's it. Let's put it this way: it's not that they can't lose or Steph can't lose. It's just sometimes a bad bet to bet against champions, people who've been there before, people who mm-hmm. are still playing at elite levels. It's just a bad bet. So he like said, I don't think. The same way, like you said, I don't think it'll be easy. Um, I don't think it'll be, like, literally the exact thing you said. I don't think Steph can walk in there and shoot terribly and they play horribly and they get and he still win. Like, he's going to have to be great. But I think that in these type of moments where you know, like, look, we need to win this game or our season's over, i.e. game seven last year, like, mm-hmm. those greats, most of the time, they end up being great. So, along with the injuries that the Kings do face, I do feel like the Warriors will win this game. Um, and like I said, I hope it's a good one. I think it is going to be a good one, um, but I think they'll they'll end up getting the win. Yeah, and the, and the last thing I'll say about this game, um, the the Warriors had a great game plan for Sabonis last year and made him significantly less effective in that series mm-hmm. than he was the entirety of the regular season. Um, that's kind of starting to become a, a theme in Sabonis's career. His, his playoff performances have been very subpar to how he performs in the regular season. And a lot of that sometimes just has to do with the fact that Draymond was giving him that, that 15, 17 footer and he just wouldn't mm-hmm. take it. He's sitting here looking to DHO pass out of the high block. Like he has to come out aggressive if, if Sacramento wants a chance. Cause you know, without Malik, without Kevin Herter, like he's got to step up offensively from a scoring perspective. The rebounding is great. The assisting, the playmaking is great. All he's able to do as a, a DHO man or a screen and roll guy is phenomenal. They need a little bit more out of you, especially if the both of us just put you all NBA third team over De'Aaron. Like you gotta you gotta come to play, um, especially knowing that they had your number last year. And going against Draymond, you know, they had the history between those two. The fact that, you know, he <laughs> stomped on him. <them>. Literally, <laughs> literally stomped on him. Literally stomped on him. Uh, but was able to neutralize you. I'm pretty sure Draymond's not gonna let you just just forget about that i'm sure you're gonna be right. hearing about that and i just think that that's an added component to it I'm not saying that sabonis can't you know be tough and step up and but like, look i'm gonna take it to you because because of what you did last year but again it's not just steph curry who's great draymond is also one of the greatest defenders ever as well so it's like in big moments like this I f- i'm pretty sure draymond's gonna be on his a game unless he gets ejected <laughs> but other than that yeah. if he's playing like I, I trust him as far as defensively to do his best job on some bonus, and I, I just think, like I said, it's a bad bet to get a bet against the Warriors. Right. Uh, so that then would bring us to what would be the last playing game out west, which, uh, based on our predictions, are are going to hit. The Lakers are going to slide in at that seven seed against Denver. So to find out who will be the eight seed and taking on OKC, there will be a game in New Orleans against uh, the Pelicans and the Warriors. Who would you take in that winner go home matchup? See, the thing with the Pelicans is like, I don't know what team I'm getting with the Pelicans, bro. Because there's times where Zion is unstoppable. And they play and they can, you know, take out a little small ball lineup where they take Valentinus out and they just look like mm-hmm. he has a free range to do whatever he wants and kind of run a point a little bit. It's like it's tough to 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 predict what they're gonna bring. The grand the reason why I'm so comfortable to say they're gonna lose against the Lakers is because honestly, I don't know what it is when he plays the Lakers. Nine is just not the same. I don't know if it's the size. I don't know if it's like seems you know, like every time when he goes to the basket, he's getting stripped. Like we're playing good defense, but with the Warriors, it's a little bit different. Even though they still are a good defensive team with Draymond anchoring everything down there, I still think I would lean the Warriors because still it goes back to you know you don't bet against the champions. You don't bet against mm-hmm. people who's been there before. Um, yeah, but I, I think that one it will be – that's a close one. That's a really close one, especially yeah. coming off – the Pelicans coming off of would be two back-to-back losses to the Lakers. Season on the line, you're playing at – that's three home. You're three games at home again. Right. So that, that to me, is a very, very tough one. 
Right now, I would lean the Warriors, but I definitely want to see how the actual game shake out for mm-hmm. both of these to like really feel confident in my pick. Um, I'm actually going to disagree. I would take New Orleans in this matchup. And really? a lot of it has to do right now with what they've been doing since Dyson Daniels has been back is I've New Orleans has run a lot of lineups where it's they have different variations, but one of the main ones is they'll have BI, they'll have Zion, they'll have uh Trey Murphy, they'll have Herb Jones, and then they'll it's Dyson Daniels. And like there's no five on the court. Dyson Daniels is such a good passer. Um, he can be he's such a great connector for that lineup. Um, and sometimes is in that uh when Bruce Brown was was with Brooklyn type of role where he can come off that short role and is just such a good decision maker. Um, and I think the the pace that they'll be able to play at with that lineup a lot. Um, and obviously still having Valanchunas there if they want to go big, him or, or Larry Nance is not bigger, but because they're going to be running a lot of Draymond at the five, like he's going to have mm-hmm. the size advantage there. Um, and – the versatility between Zion as a passer and B.I. as a passer and Dyson Daniels as a passer, Herb Jones, when he gets it going, can knock down a lot of threes. We already know about Trey Murphy. I just think their offense is going to present a lot of problems for Golden State defensively. And vice versa, that same lineup is so versatile on the defensive side of the ball. They're so athletic. They play fast. Couple of things get out of control. As we mentioned, it's going to be in New Orleans. That crowd is going to be rocking. They're itching for some playoff basketball. Um, they're going to be able to get out in transition. You got guys who can run. You got people who can come down. Jordan Hawk is not to to mention as uh, to mention as well. Come down. Um, him and Trey Murphy can come down. Hit his three in transition. You got guys who can attack the rim in transition. I just the Warriors. I think are going to have a tough time defending the the Pelicans in this matchup. Um, and so, uh, honestly, like you mentioned, a lot of it will come down to how Zion performs because they're gonna get, they're gonna sag off, they're gonna leave him open for the three. I don't want him to settle. I want him to be aggressive. I want him to like or go through Draymond's chest. They're letting a lot more contact go. Like set the tone early. Like make them help you. Make them send people from the weak side. Kick out to the shooters. And I think a couple of things will start going. Jose Alvarado has been going crazy from the three-point line too lately. I I just think they have too much offensively for this Warriors lineup to deal with. Gary Payton I don't think is going to be available for this game. Um, he, I think, recently just got injured as well. I just saw a report that um, he, I don't think, it looks like he doesn't look like he's going to play in their first game against Sacramento. So his status is going to be questionable. Um, and – like we mentioned, they have two guys that I put on uh, my all rookie team. They've never experienced this type of atmosphere before. That's um, true, and they're going to be heavily relied upon to be able to to be big contributors here, contributors um, for this team. So, as much as I just mentioned, it's hard to bet against Steph and, and all that. This Pelicans team and Zion in particular has had such a phenomenal second half of the season. I don't think they squander it and, and bounce out here in the plane. And I think they slide in at the eight seed and, and put together what I think is a very exciting one, eight matchup between new Orleans and OKC. Yeah. To me, my biggest thing is I just don't know what to expect with the Pelicans. Cause everything you said, it definitely is great and definitely could work. My thing is like, we'll Zion stuff. That's the main reason why I say I need to really need to see how the game plays out because you could say right now the game they played against the Lakers when they just got 30 piece was the biggest game of their season. You know what I mean? You win that game, you're out of the play in. Like, yeah, you, I just feel like I just get your A, your A game and you, you gave me a dud. So it's like you have a bunch of young guys on that team as well. Granted, you know, CJ is a little bit of a veteran over there, but I just don't know what to expect from those guys versus, you know, a Warriors team where even if they're not a better team overall, the fact that they've been there, they have that experience. Um, he's been in their situations where there's look, they've been in series where they even like obviously it's different teams, different situations. Mm-hmm. But when they played the Celtics in the championship, a lot of people think that the Celtics were a better team. Yeah. But, you know, what I'm saying they still found a way through experience to, you know, uh, uh, be in there before they find a way to actually win that. So in mm-hmm. a one game, you know, winner take all. I feel like anything could happen. 
As of right mm-hmm. now, I still lean the Warriors, but like I said, I really I'm very curious to see how the games play out for both of these teams. Yeah. To to see how my pick will, you know, will go. Because the Pelicans, granted, I think the Lakers are gonna win. You think the Lakers are gonna win as well. But the Pelicans dud again, then I'm like, I I don't have really have no confidence. But if they oh, but if they, you know, put up a fight and Zion plays like actual Zion, like how he, you know, how he normally does, then that could mm-hmm. change my 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 vote a little bit. I feel a little bit more comfortable and confident because the, the back half of the season, they were much more consistent. I, I know I mentioned it like probably a couple months ago. I was like, I really want to lock into more Pelicans game. I got the opportunity mm-hmm. to really like deep dive um, through some of their games and just watch some of it live or whether it's watching back recaps. Like I feel much more comfortable from what I'm going to see. It's tough because like I said, they did happen to dud the very last game of the season. It was mm-hmm. not a good look, but um, I, I, I'm comfortable in thinking that I really think they'll beat this Warriors team. I just think it's, it's, it's too much for Steph to shoulder for him to be, beat the Kings and then turn around in two days and go to New Orleans and then beat the Pelicans as well. Um, and if the Pelicans win against the Lakers, like I, I would feel the same way. I would take the Lakers, um, over the Warriors in that one game elimination too. I, I don't see a world where the Warriors, let me I mean, they'll that. make it out. You just, if you had to lean away, you don't think they'll make it out, right? Because they, they're still, I was gonna say, I don't see a world, but there's definitely a world where the Warriors make it out because it's, it's Steph Curry, like I said, you're, right? You're asking for two phenomenal games from him, he can give you that, right? Um, but if, like I said, if I had to bet, I just I don't think Golden State can get out of this gauntlet, it's tough, and I really I would love to see OKC New Orleans in the first round. Like that would be a great series. It's going to be active. It's going to be scrappy. Like I, I want to see that. I want to see. I want to see Zion dry, putting his shoulder through chest, going to the stanchion. Mm-hmm. Chet, Chet. <laughs> um, like it, I just, I'd love to see that matchup. I want to see Herb on Shea. Like I want to see a lot. Um, so. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. If I had to choose one, I'd hope the Pelicans win for sure. Mm-hmm. I always say I want to see what this Pelicans team is about when it comes playoff time, man. I really want to yeah. see Zion in the playoffs. I want to see all these guys putting it together. That's gonna be fun. Uh, that'd be a really fun like first round matchup. Yeah. Um, we can save the even some of the the matchups that are already set, uh, like a Cleveland Orlando, uh, Bucks Pacers, Timberwolves Suns, and then Clippers Mavericks. We can save that for next week when we do a full like deep dive on when the playoffs are actually set. But real quick, I, I do want to say this. Magic are making it to the second round. I Cleveland, bro, they look bad. As I said it a couple times now. What's good with Darius Garland, man? What's going on? Donovan Mitchell has the nagging injuries now. Like, I think that series can get out of hand for them quick. And we could be looking at back-to-back first-round exits for a Cleveland team. And Donovan Mitchell might be looking to play elsewhere. I, uh, listen, all I'm going to say is, I don't know. I honestly don't know who I'm picking in that series. Yeah, I haven't really put that much thought into it. Mm-hmm. But it would be bad if the Cavs lose when they purposely lost to play the Magic. So to play the Magic. That would be a bad Real game. bad. That would be a horrible one. And... I don't know. I just, I, I really don't know who I'm picking. And some of these, like, I haven't put enough thought in to say a prediction. Yeah. But just know we, we got to have some good series, bro. Oh, my God. 100%. Um, USA, oh, no, real, quick, real quick, what is the what's the worst series here? Because no series I'm looking at is like, this sucks. Maybe Celtics. Worst like, series in terms of, oh, like, easy is lopsided? Just as far as, like. Yeah, like what's the gonna be? Because I don't think there's nothing here that's legit not a good series. Well, if, if somehow, some way, Bulls or Hawks get out, that would be the worst one. Oh, for sure. Um, but uh, Celtics versus uh, you know Sixers or Miami, I think, is intriguing because of the history between Boston and Miami, and then obviously if Joel is playing, having Embiid go up against the Celtics, so like that has some level of intrigue. Knicks versus either one of those teams, too, I think is interesting. Bucks Pacers, I think, even is is interesting, too. Like, you know, they had their moments earlier in the season. Like, that's going to spark that back up. 
Pacers had their number most of the season. Yeah, honestly, bro, like, I, I really think people are going to be surprised that this Cavs Magic Series is not going to be that close, bro. If I had to pick one, like, mm -hmm. I, I, maybe I'm being so overly confident, bro. Magic defense is so good. Mm -hmm. And Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell have already been struggling as is. Like, the light might be too bright again. And yeah. we could be looking at, Five, six games to get them up out of here. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll see. You're not yeah. wrong. We'll see. Um, real quick before we wrap things up, just got a Woj notification that USA basketball has finalized the eleven of the twelve spots for their Olympic roster. Oh, yes. Yeah, we send in the Avengers, bro. We needed to. We definitely we needed to. Steph Curry. LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum, Joel Embiid, Devin Booker, Tyrese Halliburton, Ooh. Anthony Edwards, Drew Holiday, <laughs> Bam Adebayo, and Anthony Davis, and the team is keeping the last spot open. This is Ooh. also Steph's first Olympics. First one? He didn't... No, you also got to think, because like he, he had the stretches... Um, where once he really came to that level, like 2014, 2015, the Olympics was 2016. He would have been coming off of a championship. He might have just declined. Um, and then 2020, was he coming off an injury that year? Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. That was when – Yeah, so he yeah, might have just injury, declined. Yeah. Um, so, like, it's actually – it might be his first and only Olympic run with Team USA. But well, it's going to end in a gold medal because they, they not losing. Steph, <laughs> they not Ron, losing. KD, like, bro, the the lineups that they can run are absurd, bro. They just have – they have one spot remaining and the remaining names to choose from. I'll, I'll pick the – I'll say the, like, ones that probably is the best chance. You got guys like Desmond Bain, Paolo. Uh, Jalen Brown, Jalen Brunson, Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler don't even care about the regular season. He ain't playing no damn Olympics. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Jaren Fox, Paul George. I don't want to see Harden. He good. He just want to have a good time. Kyrie, Jaren Jackson Jr. Ka oh Kawhi is not gosh. playing, but if Kawhi, what? Donovan Mitchell, D. Lillard. They got some oh, Austin Reeves, low key, but. Derek White, you gotta matter of fact, put in Derek White to all. Yeah, yeah. Give, me, give me, give me, give me Derek, Derek White. White. I was like, what does this team need? Is like, I feel like they could definitely utilize another like high, like a a very good wing defender, mm -hmm. and yeah, they don't like they don't need guy. another big between bro and B being able to cycle through and B Bam and AD should be illegal, bro. The defense is crazy. What? That should be illegal. You should not be allowed to compile all three of them on the same team. They they do need – if I had to choose, it would definitely be another, like, wing defender type guy. They yeah. don't need no more offense. They good. Yeah, bro, That's put why Derek White up there. Put yeah. Derek White up there. <laughs> That's why I, I want to say Brunson at first when you said his name, but I was like, it, where does he even slot in here? Like, it don't Steph work. and Tyrese and D-Book and, and Andrew, like – his right, you got LeBron gonna be hitting on the ball. Like, no, he, yeah, nah, they don't need no. Like, they got the they got playmaking, they got shooting, they got bigs. Yeah, give me, give me Derek White, man. I wouldn't be mad at Kawhi or PG if I t listen. Honestly, bro, you put Kawhi in there and be like, yo, bro, you don't need to score, just lock up. That, pff. and then when we, then you know, what I'm saying when it's need be, but come on, man, that's right. that'd be a little overkill. We don't need Kawhi. We don't even all that just give me Derek White. He know his role. He gonna play hard. He gonna play defense, and he gonna pass and shoot. I'm excited for the Olympics, man. Now I just got me because you know what else is about to be crazy. What France? France about to be running a Vic Rudy lineup. I see now. <laughs> oh my gosh, nobody's no, going to the paint. The paint is over with. There's there, your there might be zero layups in their games ever. Like how you laying the ball up, bro? Over what? Over the palm trees down there? Nah, bro, it's not happening. Bro, and the fact that they were this close to getting Embiid to to go and be a French national player too, could you? Have, they would have really ran a whoever else. Probably it could have been Killian Hayes out there, bro. <laughs> Wemby at the three, Embiid at the four, Rudy at the five. Over. Who's guarding them? Who's guarding them? Over. 
Yo, Wimby, at the, Wimby is just a supersized Kevin Durant on that team. <laughs> hey, come on. What are we doing? Yeah, that would be crazy. That would be crazy. Ah, playoff basketball, man. I'm so excited. Yeah, it's about to be a lit one, man. It's going to be a fun. It's going to be a fun, uh, fun playoffs for sure. I can't wait. I cannot wait. Man. Oh, I'm looking at the list you just... Bro, they put way too many people's names up here. Bro, like like half of these guys is not in consideration for real, bro. Duncan Robinson? No disrespect, but like... What are we doing? Josh Hart? Bobby Portis? See, Bobby Portis was on the team last year. (laughs) Side note, side note. Why is the WNBA draft like 24 hours after the championship? Like, you can't let them breathe a little bit? Like No, it's always been like that, too. Bro, I feel like the WNBA is so rushed. Like, I swear they'd be having, like, three championships in one calendar year. Like, everything is so rushed for no reason. Yeah, it's – I don't know. I, they, I think it's because the league always takes place in the NBA offseason in the summer. And so this just makes, like, sense timing-wise for, uh, for the draft to take place because then it gives you, like – two months leading into the whatever the season. Uh, I'm going to be locked in now, though. Facts. Because the talent is on another level, like even outside of Caitlin Clark, bro. It's icons going into the the draft and don't sleep too. Like the fact that Caitlin Clark went first to the fever, bro. They got a Leah Boston who was the number one pick last year. She was a bucket at South Carolina. She was a bucket in her rookie season in Indiana too. They just put together a dynamic duo in two years. Mm-hmm. Hey man, they're gonna get more eyes in WNBA, man. That's what's up. Hundred percent. If you was Caitlin Clark, would you take Snoop Dogg up or Snoop Dogg Ice Cube up <laughs> on his on his offer? Five M's and playing a big three. Yeah, I just cook everybody. <laughs> Why not? I just give you five M's. I cook everybody and then go about my business. That's it. Like go, but like still being in WNBA, right? Just like they said, he said he would adjust the schedule to make sure that she could do both. Oh yeah, I do. That I'm cook- series. Yeah, I cook all them, all them old NBA players, and give my bread, and I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> it was it is mad old heads in there, like. <laughs> Dudes yeah, out here with arthritis. Cool. That's why it's half court. <laughs> they exactly. can't run up and down. Bro. They can't run up and down the full court. Nah, give me Kayla Clark. She's going to cook all of them. Get, get them five M's and she's out of there. If I'm not mistaken, I think the max salary – let me actually look it up so I'm not capping. But I think the max salary for the WNBA is two hundred. Yeah, two hundred and forty-two k um, a year. It's just like, bro, Sheesh. she'd be making – 20 years worth of max salary in one year. Yeah, give me, the, give me the five M's. She probably don't need it, though, with her, like, brand deals and endorsements that she's been getting through her time at Iowa. But, bro, five Still. M's is five M's, bro. Can't pass that up, bro. It's not like it's a little different from the NBA where it's like, oh, you're going to make that 10 times more. Like, nah, give me give me the five M's. Give me the secured bread. Yeah, five M's is – five M's is crazy. But – with that, that is going to do it for episode 53 of the Off the Glass podcast. Keep stay or keep staying tuned to the channel because with the playoffs here, we are going to be giving you a bunch of content, be able to put together some recaps, probably after even the first set of playing games. Um, going to be giving you deep dives and analysis on every single playoff matchup once those are set in stone next week. Um you're going to be doing that all the way through the postseason. If you remember how we did it around this time last year, it's going to be structured pretty much the same where every single episode is just really deep dives into every single series, what's been working for each team, what changes and adjustments need to be made. Um, this is the best time to really dive into the, the nitty-gritty and the X's and O's and the schematics of what coaches are doing, what teams are doing, to be able to gain that little bit of edge to get you over the top, to get you to the next round of the playoffs. So, we're going to be keeping you covered with all that. Um, continue to follow us at the socials that you see there at the bottom of the screen. Like, comment, subscribe to the channel. We appreciate you as always. I'm Billy. That's Damon. We out. Peace.